Springtime is probably my favourite time of the year uh, for catching carp. Uh, they've just woken up. And there's the thing, like during the winter, carp will feed, but they go into this torbidity that makes them just slow right down. They're a cold-blooded creature. Yeah, it, it just once you get that bit of heat in the spring and you get that lengthening of the days, the carp wake up and that's it. Once they've woken, once they get really motivated, it doesn't matter what the weather does after you've had that initial hit of good weather. You know, it can be hail, it can be, we've had snow in April, but once they wake up, it doesn't matter what the weather does, they still keep going. It's just like a, a switch in them. And you know, the, the bird life shows you it all as well. The bird life, everyone's uh, laying eggs, nesting, fighting with each other, being very territorial. It's just that wakening moment of nature. It's, as I said, it's my favorite time of year. first spring session didn't go uh, to plan really. I went back to um, one of my favourite lakes, Loch Gall, which is a big deep venue, 37 acres, 20, 25 feet deep as an average. Um, uh, and the weather was, was really sort of against me, very high pressure and not just high pressure, but it was cold. The wind was hacking down the lake, very strong wind. And it just, for five days I sat there looking at bobbins, uh, nothing happened and it was uh, a very quiet session. I fished a little bay to the side away from the wind thinking that some of the carp may just push in out of that main body of water and uh, get out of, of the way of that wind uh, because they had woken up at that stage but they're just not as woken up as other lakes. Smaller venues that are shallower tend to heat up quicker, the fish switch on quicker, and high pressure doesn't seem to affect them in a negative way as much as a deep lake. And that's just my finding, you know, well, let's put it like this, Loch Gall in particular doesn't really respond that well in a high pressure situation. As I said, I blanked for uh, about five days. Uh, it was a camping trip. But you know, I never write off these blank sessions because you're always learning, or should be always learning. There should be something that you come away with that again adds to the jigsaw of you catching the next time or the next time. Now I've often talked about fishing being a game of percentages and that the most successful anglers are the guys that kind of rack up those percentages, whether it be with their tackle, fine tuning rigs, using, you know, going through all the different tackle on the market and picking out what is the very best for them and working out the mechanics of their rigs, fine tuning everything, fine tuning their setup, fine tuning their lines, their line lay, their bait. The more you can get these percentages stacked up, the more chance you have uh, of being successful. As I said, the Loch Gull trip was a bust, uh, and I had to kind of go away, lick my wounds, and work out what the next move was. Um, I, one of my long time, you know, fishing buddies, I've been fishing with Colin Seaton for, uh, it's gotta be 25 years plus now, and Colin and I go back a long way. We started the Irish Carp Society together. Um, and I, Colin did an awful lot of hard work in the early days promoting Irish carping. Um, and uh, he doesn't get at all the uh, recognition that he deserves for that. 
but um, Colin's an all-round good guy, but he was bending my arm to join a, a, a group up here in Northern Ireland called NICAS, which is the Northern Ireland Carp Society. guys have been able to produce some of the best fishing. What they've done is they've taken on board waters around the Northern Ireland uh, area and they've created some of the, what are undoubtedly some of the best carp fisheries. Well, no, they are the best carp fisheries in the country. Um, they're really well managed. They're very safe. All are rot fenced. They are um, stocked with Tony Campbell's fish carp for restocking from the UK. Most beautiful looking fish in the world. And, um, you know, it's just, the, these venues are cracking. So they have about six or seven lakes and they're still expanding that. And I reckon within another few years, they'll probably have another six or seven lakes added to that list. I had a seven day trip planned. And what I wanted to do was um, arrange a meeting with two of the committee members, uh, Darren O'Reilly and Martin McGibbon, who are also now team members of Nutribates. These guys have been Nutribait users for a number of years and they've been absolutely cutting the fish up here to breaking records and, uh, and uh, really doing some amazing stuff with their own captures on Nutribates. And um, I wanted to get you know some time on the bank with them uh, because as I said they're committee members of NICAS and they have a lot to say about the you know the way things have been established in Northern Ireland. So what the plan was, was to come up here on a Tuesday and fish until Friday on a place called Swan Hole. Now Swan Hole is right next to the sea. In fact, it's so close to the sea that there's just a road dividing uh, the sea from the lake. Um, it's about 11 acres in size. It's very shallow, four, four and a half feet as an average. Um, shallower in parts, slightly deeper, maybe down to six, seven foot in one part. And it is, the most beautiful, stunning looking lake you can imagine. It's just gorgeous. It's in the middle of a, a, an estate, forestry on one side. You're fishing in this most beautiful environment. And it's got carp to about 25 pound. Now it's known as the hardest lake in the list of NICAS waters. In fact, most anglers give it a swerve because it's such a weedy lake and uh, it's got, it's got its, its challenges, you know? So you just gotta, there's a lot of overcoming to do to get to the fish, but the fish are beautiful, very pretty. And uh, it's, it's a venue that would, would be my kind of venue. It's, it's, it's where I'd like to spend some time fishing. So that was, as I said, from Tuesday to Friday, I was meant to fish with them. And then very early morning on Friday morning, at about six in the morning, I was gonna pack up and fly over to this lake, which is called Brook Hall. Now this is a much smaller lake. It's just under two acres. It's very close quarter, intimate fishing. Uh, it's got a stock of about 50 fish. There's about three fish that are knocking around the 30 pound mark. And uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful lake. Lots of, uh, you know, mid to high doubles with um, a good smatter in the twenties to boot. Swan Hole uh, proved to be tricky. I set up in peg three, which uh, is beautiful peg, and uh, placed my baits, and by the next morning I'd had a nine pounder, um, which I was informed by, uh, <laughs> by Darren is one of the smallest fish in the lake. And that night then, Darren had an eight and a half pounder, so <laughs> he beat me, the <laughs> smallest fish in the lake. I, I, I managed another 10 pound common. So I, I managed to get two fish under my belt, and I lost a decent fish in the weed, hook pull happens especially on the lake and in fairness everyone who was getting runs on the lake uh you know it, it really was there was a, a lot of hook pulling going on the fish were just not picking up the baits like you'd like them to i sent the drone up and i noticed that all the fish were stacked up in the left hand bay towards uh, the top end of the lake and there was just so many of them and they were just up and down a section of water they were stopping shy of where I was, but they were going up and down the middle of the lake and back around and into the, the corner. And Craig the bailiff 
came down, saw the fact that they were all up there and jumped in and he had a cracking couple of days and uh, caught some beautiful fish. Lost a good few uh, from hook pulls. Again, funny takes, but you know, connecting and then dropping them quite quickly. Um, but he did a bit of adjusting on his rigs and uh, he started catching really, really well. Caught some lovely fish. I was meant to leave, as I said, on Friday morning, but I got a call from the bailiff on this particular lake, Brook Hall, which apparently is the second hardest lake in the NICAS lineup, um, because again, it's a very weedy venue, but the carp are very tricky in here. Uh, so I got a very um, odd call from him. Connor says, Jay, pack up now, don't stay, get yourself over, because there's a guy who's been fishing here and it's, it's, it's just switched on. He had a four or five carp over a few days and uh, that never happens on this lake. It's just not a lake that produces that amount of fish. So um, I didn't have to be told twice. It'd gone slow in our section. The fish were stacked up and I we couldn't touch them because other anglers were on the fish now. So I decided to bounce early. So I, you know, I made my, packed up, uh, said my goodbyes, and off I trundled over here. It's about an hour's drive, give or take, over to this particular lake from Swan Hole. And I arrived, Colin was camped out on the far side, and the car park swim, which is the one I'm in here, which gives uh, you an awful lot of water to go at. Um, for this particular lake, it doesn't look like a huge amount, but it, you know, compared to the other swims, there's a lot more water here, and it's the one that appealed to me the most. It's also the shallowest, and we were having brilliantly high pressured sunny days in the day and very cold at night. Car park was it, it's the shallowest part of the lake. The sun is beating down on it all day. There's got to be carp up here. They've got to move from the slightly deeper part of the lake because it runs down deeper to about 10 foot down the very bottom end, the dam end. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a kind of a very small little reservoir. And um, so I decided that, you know, looking at the sunshine, the high pressure, this is where I would imagine the carp to gravitate to. Put out my rods um, using my favourite mix, mixture now, which is uh, code, uh, which I take a load of the shelf lives, I soak them in activated liquid for about three or four weeks, and then I crumb them all up through the grinder on the Ridge Monkey grinder. But I put it through twice so that they ground up even more. So I only want small little bits of food. Uh, into that goes uh, code pellets in eight mil that have been soaking in the activator for uh, weeks and that's mixed together with the crumbed up boilies and then in goes some of the new code carpet feed which is there's you can tell with the way it clouds in the water there's a lot of nut meal in it uh peanut tiger nut meal uh, it's beautiful really beautiful aroma to it that went in and then in a real good dowsing of activator and that's just been left soaked for a few weeks and that because it's all shelf life it stays in the bucket it's in here it stays in the bucket and I can just dip in and, and take what I need. I put that into another bucket and then I put a tiny bit of lake water in to dampen it down, uh, a little bit more activator uh, liquid and it's good to go. So the other auxiliary item that I put in on top of this was I put in some maggots. I had some maggots with me for Swan Hole because I believed that they were uh, kind of a, a good thing to have. And then, so I just said, well, if they're taking over maggots in, Bro in, in Swan Hole, they've got to be taking uh, maggots over in Brook Hall. There's no other fish in here but carp and stickleback, so it was a safe bet that maggots would be a, a bit of a goer. I picked my spots in the swim, 
And, and, and the one thing I'd always recommend is, uh, like when I got here, uh, the bailiff turned up, Connor. He pointed me out in a few places, you know, to look at. And it, that's the one thing I always recommend. Listen to what a bailiff is going to tell you. They live on the water. They know the movements of the fish. They, they know and understand the fishery. You know, listen to what they have to say and then make up your own mind and do your own things as well. Because, you know, always remember as well, it's a double-edged sword. If they're telling you how to fish an area, then they're telling everyone how to do it. And if everyone's doing the same thing, you're going to reap the same results. So sometimes you listen to them and maybe use that as your starting point and then start tweaking and doing your own things, which I've been kind of doing over the last few days. One of the big things I was told about was don't use too much bait. Darren has said it to me, Marty said it to me. They're talking about PVA little bags and sticks. Don't put too much in. Don't put any boilies in because the fish, they'll back off it and they, they, they won't want it. They're, as I said, they're tricky in here, but that's not how I operate. As I said, if you, if you do what everyone else does, then you'll reap the same results. And I wanted to do something different. So I decided that I put in you know, at least three or four times what they were telling me. The crumb that I'm using, the maggots, it's all small food items. And then what I wanted to do was fish over the top of that with a small pop-up. Uh, I've been testing the, um, these new code white pop-ups that have been designed at Nutribase. Um, it, it, it's funny, it, it, it's only a chance I got these. I phoned Richard, the owner of Nutribates, about a week ago, and I said to him, I said, do you know what? You know, would you think or consider about bringing out um, a, a white pop-up for the code range? And he says, funny you say that, Jay. He says, um, we've got them air drying, we've got them. So I begged him, I said, put a couple of pots in the post to me and get them over to me as fast as you can. They landed and uh, I had them with me. So I've been testing these this week. White pop-ups for me, are just, especially early in the season, they're just my favourite colour by a country mile. White is just something that just stands out. My second to that would be like a soft pastel pink, but whites are my go-to, my number one favourite. And up to now, Liver Supreme has been ruling the roost. It's, it's, it's certainly my favourite alternative pop-up. Um, but I wanted to be able to match the code hatch with the same flavour combination, but uh, I wanted it to stand out because code boilies are very dark. So I've got two out in open water away from the edges because everyone casts to the edges uh, because that's what anglers do. So I said I'd pull back a bit uh, and I put one off the island. Everyone goes close to the island. I'm about a rod length out from it. Um, the first morning here, so I arrived Thursday afternoon, set plotted up and then um, Rods are all on the dance floor by Thursday evening. Friday morning, I've got my first fish on, uh, which was an 11 pound uh, mirror. Now at that stage, I hadn't even got all my camera gear set up, so I just videoed it in the cradle. And there's something else. I've already mentioned that all these lakes are auto fenced, but they also do inside biosecurity. The net, the cradle, everything that you need to look after your fish is supplied. You sign in for it when you arrive in the, in the, um, the clubhouse and uh, you pick up your landing net, your sling, and your, your cradle, so that you don't bring any of your own stuff with you. And this is so that you don't transport viruses and pathogens and bacteria from venue to venue, and you're looking after the fish. That was my first fish, and I'd, I'd sort of managed to go to Swan Hole and catch a couple of fish. All right, not very big, but still, a, you know, new venue, new bait, new fish it, it was just you know a treble bounce you know it was great great feeling got to here and the first morning uh, official morning on the lake and i've had a fish under my belt i was chuffed so i knew that was one spot i'd keep my rod on that and then i was tweaking my middle rod and i found a nice little area um and the next uh morning it it it, it bundled away again and um I had a 24 pound mirror. Absolute stunning fish. Really just incredible. And it was minus three that night and it came at about, um, it came about six, half six in the morning. 
and it, it, it just it gave a real good account for itself. Um, I'm using two and a half pound 12 foot high S rods, so there was such a great bit of action on the rod buckled over uh, and it just trundled up and down and wouldn't give itself up. But um, yeah, I managed to get that one and, and it weighed 24 pound, which according to Connor, um, who is one of the bailiffs and uh, Michael, who's another bailiff, Michael actually caught the fish at uh, 20 pound about in 2019, I think it was, and he named it Finn. So I managed to catch Finn at 24 pound, and um, apparently it's one of, one of, if not the biggest mirror in here, which, what a result, stunning to boot. So I had now had two fish in the morning slot, 3 a.m. And, and three to half six, seven in the morning seemed to be the feeding spell in this particular area. Um, so, it was then just a case of um, replace the rod and uh, see what happens. And then just coming on to dusk that night, um, it, 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 the rod went again, same rod, and I hooked into a fish that, f that felt big. Uh, luckily, one of the, the, the chaps here uh, was by my side. And um, as, it, as it boiled on the surface, there was a massive ball of weed on its head. And I'd already said, I think this is a, a good one. This is a heavy fish. And then I was like, no, no, it's not a big fish. <laughs> it's just a ball of weed with a fish underneath it. So it's, it's obviously not as big as, as I thought. Um, got it in the net, weed fell off. And there in the net is the um, biggest carp in the lake, uh, common known as BBC. Um, and again, this is all new to me. I've been told this, uh, the fish is called BBC, big, uh, what is it, Brook Hall Big Common. I think that's what it stands for. And um, <laughs> what can I tell you? Uh, it's a new late record at £30, two ounces, um, beating the old record by one or two ounces. I'm not, I'm not sure what it was, but um, apparently I now hold the new record here. Um, again, you know, to come to a new venue that you know is rock hard, uh, yes, it's switched on, and you know, my timing is absolutely perfect, but wow you know to have one of the biggest mirrors in the lake and the biggest common in one day just awesome you know it's, it's, it's a red letter day that and that rarely rarely happens um to me <laughs> but it happens but it rarely happens and i was just so grateful um the the weather changed on sunday well sunday morning it started to rain um and we lost the blue skies uh, and it was a completely different day grey, overcast, miserable, um, and nothing happened all day Sunday, um, not a bite, nothing. And then uh, this morning, which is now Monday, as I'm filming this, and I'm here until tomorrow, um, I had a 19 pound mirror at half three this morning um, from the same spot again. Um, uh, it's just, what, a, what an outstanding session, just brilliant. I come back to the thing of, you know, f successful fishing is a game of percentages and I'm an average angler and I get averagely lucky now and again. But what I am known for is being a bit of grafter. Um, and what I will do is I will make sure and double check everything that I will use the best things on the market. I'll spend the money and I'll invest in the best gear. I'll buy the best tackle. And, and I want to use the very best in my fishing. So, you know, my rods and my reels have got the 5500s matched to, match to my two and a halfs because that's perfect for this type of venue. I don't want to be using big 13 footers that are high SIVs. I want to be able to enjoy small water carping. So I have a different setup here. But, um, you know, it is a weedy lake. There's lots of snags uh, to be careful of. So I'm on the GTHD line, which is by um, Gardner. And it's, to me, it's the best line I've ever used. That's in 18 pound. It sinks really, really well, which is what I want to do because it's, you know, a shallow lake. I don't want the fish bumping my line and when they're moving around. My rig is, is, is of, you know, big importance as well. Cause you know, again, the components I'm using, I've got an avid lead clip, which uh, allows me pop on my lead. Now, again, people think a lead is a lead is a lead, but I'm not quite in that camp. Um, I have a guy who makes my leads bespokely for me, um, ET Leads, 
is the company and they are hands down the best quality leads I've used. And the great thing is I can say to Eamon who runs the company, I can say this is what I want. I want this size lead, this shape lead, this coating and it, job done. Um, the coating nut on the leads I think is very important. I've got this fuzzy green and fuzzy brown coating that I think just really blends in to the bottom on a lake like this better than some of the more smoother coatings on the leads. And again, you know, you can say, well, it's a lead, it's plugging into the silt or it's lying just there next to the, you know, the rig. It, it, it's, is it really that important? And I'm increasing those percentages that every component I use has a purpose and, and is the best I can make it. So that the more I get of these percentages together, the more successful I become. So, you know, that's that's sort of the lead clip and the lead. Behind that, I've got, uh, I think it's called um, King of the Pond, I think is the name of the company. Don't hold me to that one. But it's their uh, tubing, it's a tungsten tubing. It's really heavy. It's kind of a, a, a matty green in color. Just behind that, I've got this little avid lead that clips onto the line and you twist them on. And the more you twist them, they lock on the line without damaging it. And uh, I just put one of them just behind the tungsten tubing again, just to keep that super pin down because I think that's really, really important to keep your line down around the hook bait. You don't want any fins touching any of the components because it will spook them. Um, rig wise, uh, you know, most people I, I watch, uh, they're, they're using rigs of, you know, maybe six inches. Um, long, quite short hook lengths, you know, five, six inches. So I'm doing something quite different. I've got um, a, a hook length of about eight, nine inches long uh, because I know that these are big fish and as they come down to feed, as they lift back up, I need that little bit of extra play so that the hook is in their mouth and it doesn't get pulled out as they're coming back up. Um, so. The hook length material is my favorite Ridge Monkey braided material. I've not got, you know, any of these coated material on. I'm, I just wanted pure braid. And um, this one is, it's, it's spliceable. Uh, and it's, it's like a lead-free uh, material, but it sinks like a brick. And uh, I splice at both ends. So one will attach to the hook of the clip where the lead is. And the other one is then, I can use it in a multi-rig setup so that I'm fishing a pop-up and I'm using a size four J Precision hook. J Precision hooks for me are a must have. These are hand sharpened hooks that I get off Jamie Peters who um, has a, the company over in the UK. And uh, it's not that I'm lazy, I could sharpen my own hooks, but I can't just, I just can't do them the way he does them. And they are like hypodermic needles. And there are a lot of people that would tell you, you don't need super sharp, sharp hooks like that, again, percentages gain, I believe it's helped me put a lot more fish on the bank. Um, the size four seems quite big, but I'm using a pop-up and I want it to be quite aggressive. I normally would use a curve on a pop-up, uh, but on this particular rig, I'm using what he calls the wide gapes. Uh, and they're slightly beak point, but they're so sharp, they're incredible hooks. I will be honest, you know, it's, it's one of those things that every time you catch a fish, the chances are you've done the hook and you have to put a fresh hook on. But if you're fishing a tricky slow venue, you know, a few hooks for a weekend is nothing to worry about. If you're fishing a very busy water that where you're getting 20 and 30 fish, then you know, you might want to rethink your, your why you'd be using such a hand sharpened hook. But they, they certainly help me in my fishing. Again, mechanics of the rig, pop-ups are brilliant. If I am fishing them on the bottom, I'll watch out what the bottom's made of. If there's any gravel, I'm really super cautious because the gravel can actually ding the hooks quite easily. Uh, so you need to check the hook every time you wind it in, you check it to make sure it's still super sharp. I always give the hooks a quick running over with the Jag pen, which is it's, it's kind of a, a, a colorant thing that puts on a coating to stop any uh, water ingress so that they don't rust in the water because sharpened hooks are bare metal hooks. They're always gonna rust up a little bit. And by just running it with the uh, Jag pen, it, it just saves any of that hassle. I use a little uh, pop-up weight from Fox. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of them, but they, they are a tiny little pop-up weight, um, which you use a little bit of silicon tubing to lock onto the actual line. And the, the BB sinks are 15 mil Nutribate pop-ups 
perfectly. They sink down really, really slowly and they're absolutely perfect um, so that they're not banging down, they're just gently resting on top of what's on the bottom. And having that sort of set up, uh, you know, that, that pop-up weight doesn't move at all. Um, you know, it just won't slip. Uh, and I'm fishing it only about a mil to maybe a mil and a half away from the actual tubing, the, the, the kicker on the hook of the multi-rig. Uh, because um, you know, I want this sitting as low to the deck as I can. It's as low as any Ronnie rig, probably even a fraction lower than most Ronnies um, would be sitting. This is this is a, a really pretty little lake. It's 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 you know when you're used to fishing big venues to come to something like this, a very small, intimate. It's it's a joy. Uh, a lot of people would look at this and go, yeah, it wouldn't be for me. That's a pond. But um, for me, it's it's. Every water has its own set of challenges, uh, and this is, you know, one of the one of the most challenging lakes. Uh, apparently, this will shut up shop in, a, in very shortly, and the fish will just not come out again, and it will be a struggling time for everyone. Um, and that's the challenge of carp fishing. You know, it's, it's just something to keep you on your toes, and uh, I, I just I, I live for that challenge. I, I, you know, I like to move around waters. Um, you know, I plan to go back to Loch Gore in sort of late May, beginning of June, because I think at that stage it will have heated up enough and got the, you know, everything will be moving then and it'll be game back on. Uh, till then, I'm going to bounce around on here and, and maybe Swan Hole or I might try one of the other NICAS waters just to give it a go. But um, this particular venue just, just floats my boat. It just, it's, uh, it's got something special about it. Um, I mean, when you caught the biggest in the lake, where do you go? <laughs> well, there's two other fish to go for, and there's, you know, 45 other fish in here that I haven't got my name on. So it's, it's you know, the challenge is always going to be there. I, you know, I've got to that stage in, you know, people get fixated with size of carp and, you know, numbers of carp. And for me, you know, I'll catch a three pound carp and I'll have as much joy in that as a 30 pound carp. I, I love, carp I love carp fishing and it's something that um, I think that that mindset has has always sort of stayed with me I have a mate Rob Coleman who summed it up for me and it's it's, it's kind of a mantra that I've lived by ever since you know I, I, I always lived by that mantra but it's only until he put it into words that I realized that that was the mantra I lived by um, as he said the way he looks at any water it doesn't matter what's in it. If there's 10 pounders, you know, and a load of small passes, three or four pounders, he's quite happy to fish there and stay fishing there. But his challenge is to be averagely catching the bigger fish, not the smaller fish. And, and that's, I think, you know, something that I, I, I've always enjoyed. I don't care how big they are. Um, we, we scroll through social media, we Facebooking and, you know, Instagramming, and we're looking at all of these big 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, people from, you know, going abroad, and it's just, there just seems this fixation that if it's not big, it's not cool. Uh, and I disagree. I, you know, as I said, I'm happy if it's a three pounder. Um, you know, I've never lost the respect for carp just because they're small. I don't get anglers who do, but you know, this is a sport, this is a hobby, and everyone's got to do what they feel is right to them. Because there is a real no right or wrong, is there? It's, it's just what is for you. But I'm just happy out to be catching fish every now and again. As long as I'm learning, I'm not failing, and I think that's really important.